The title of the lesson tonight is Dead Before Grace. Dead Before Grace. This title, this is each one of our stories. Our stories may look a little different, but that describes all of our stories. Dead Before Grace. Every Christian you see um, has this one fact, that they were dead before grace. At one time dead, meaning separated from God. Um, Understanding this state helps us to understand a lot, especially about, as was just read, the measurable riches of God's grace. And it's a good thing, too, that our story does not end with being dead. So before we jump into Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10, let me see those notebooks. Put your notebooks in the air. Excellent. Nice, Aaron. Very nice. Um, Also, journaling Bibles. If you have a journaling Bible, put it in there. Any journaling? Okay. There we go. Got a few proud journaling Bibles. Um, Please turn to Ephesians 2, or at least mark it. We'll be really diving into the text there. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Um, But before we do that also, let me give you the three words to mark down. First one is dead, meaning spiritually lifeless, being separated not from our our body, but being separated from God. We were spiritual zombies, so to speak, walking around, the walking dead. Um, Next is sin. We'll talk a lot more about the definition of this, meaning missing the mark of failure in our relationship with God. And then finally, grace. Oh, this this very important word. Um, We don't typically use it in any sort of discussion other than a Christian sort of of discussion. Um, But it's a very important word. It gets tossed around, but it's totally critical to our walk. And I hope that tonight that we'll be able to better understand the meaning of this word grace. So why talk about it? You may be looking at the title and thinking, wow, this is a really downer of a lesson, talking about being dead, being dead uh, before grace. Why talk about it? And why did Paul bring this up in Ephesians 2? If you you look at Ephesians 1, the first verse, it talks about them being faithful in God. And there's some very strong words being used to describe their state before they came to God. Um, I was studying this passage a year ago, Um, And I was just surprised by some of the words that are used to describe the Ephesians before they came to Christ. I mean, I could understand this more if we're talking about the Corinthian church uh, with all of its problems. I can understand why Paul would bring up those sort of words, but there's very strong language to describe how people were before they came to God. But as we read, um, by understanding where we were dead, verses 1 through 3, we can so much better understand grace and the powerful working of God. This wasn't meant to shame them, and this message isn't meant to shame tonight. Godly sorrow produces repentance, not not shame. But sometimes we tend to minimize the gravity and price of our sin. That's something we as humans tend to do because of pride or something else. We, we look at these words that were just read in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, and we see dead. We see um, carrying out the passions of our flesh, being called by nature children of wrath. And we think, wow, that's some pretty, that's some pretty strong language. That's some pretty uh, strong language. Maybe that's a little extreme. Maybe I was just mostly dead. I was just partially dead. Maybe not quite uh, so extreme as that. And sometimes we use phrases like, nobody's perfect, or I'm only human, and those tend to justify those sort of actions. There's even total systems of thought, Calvinist teachings, that um, particularly total depravity, that say we were born in sin. This, is, this was inevitable that we be dead in sin. We didn't even have a choice in this. Obviously, that's incorrect, as we'll see later on in this passage. And sometimes, we don't understand the gravity of our sin because we're trying to compare our sin to others. 
Well, I was mostly dead. That person was really dead. Uh, looking at Luke 18, we see a great example of this. So please turn to Luke 18. Keep a marker in Ephesians 2. Luke 18, and I'll read verses 9 through 14. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So which person in this story was, was dead? And really the answer is both. The one dead person looked to the other dead person and thought, well, I'm not nearly as dead as they are. Like there was some sort of distinction between the two. One was totally distracted by his own deadness by comparing himself to the other. And what really what God wants of us is not necessarily to um, be down on ourselves, but to honestly take a look at ourselves and our life and understand that we are dead ourselves. And that is totally crucial to, the, to this next point. Why talk about it? Because we cannot accept grace or, or even appreciate grace without that. It says, one went to his house justified rather than the other. One was so distracted by comparing his sinfulness to the other that he forgot to even request for grace himself. Instead, he, he thanked God that he was not like the other. Um, Sometimes, you know, we, we don't think about uh, grace in this way because, well, maybe we weren't as bad in our own minds as, as we were. There's no redemption if we don't believe that we need to be purchased. There's no salvation if we don't believe that we need to be saved. I think another good example of this, a few chapters over, in, is in Luke 7. Verses 41 through 43. Here we see Jesus entering the house of a um, very, uh, very prominent Pharisee, Simon. And as he's sitting down at the table, a woman comes in and begins crying at his feet, wiping his feet with her tears and uh, using some very expensive essential oils on his feet. Um, just using a whole lot of you know, uh, everything really she had for him. And Jesus tells the Pharisee Simon this parable, starting in verse 41. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owned 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. It's not that the woman necessarily had so much greater of a debt, but that she took an honest look at the magnitude of that debt and appreciated what Christ was doing, what he was about to do. And that's really, if we want to accept grace, if we want to appreciate grace more, a lot of it's just taking a better look at ourselves and seeing what Christ saved us from and what he saved us to. So I ask you tonight, besides your kind attention that I appreciate that you have your Bible out to Ephesians 2 and that we also take an honest look at our past, our present life. Uh, I will be using the, the pronoun we because this really describes all of us as Paul himself <coughs> Use, uh, used we to describe their past sinfulness. So looking more into Ephesians 2, the first three verses start with, and you were dead. 
Ephesians 2. I'm going to go ahead and read the first three verses again. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, or by nature, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. So stopping there, let's dissect more of uh, what these and unpack more of what these phrases mean. The first one, dead and trespasses. So the Greek word, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, I think it's paroptima, which means to fall beside or to step out. It gives the idea of there's a line, and when we trespass, we step over that line. Now there could be many, uh, many ways to apply this, but particularly with regards to our relationship with God, it means to see God's line and to step over that line. It means to rebel, and that also has with it the idea of breaking trust with God. When we sin, we see God's line, and then we decide to cross it. Uh, we often don't just do this, very simply, just looking at God and say, okay, there's your line, I'm just going to cross it. Sometimes that's the case, but a lot of times we come up with a justification in our mind. Sometimes we think, okay, um, actually, God, I think the line is over there, and then we cross the line, or we make uh, some sort of excuse to make the line disappear altogether, or sometimes we even give ourselves a reason, well, God, I, I had to, to cross the line. Uh, you made me cross the line. People even look at God and say that. The next word uh, or phrase, dead in sins, uh, harmartia, which means to miss the mark. Um, this idea uh, is also seen in the Old Testament. A similar Hebrew word is used in Judges 20.16 that gives, a, I think, a good picture of this meaning. Uh, so, geta in Hebrew in Judges 20 and verse 16, speaking of the Benjaminites, among all these were 700 chosen men who were left-handed. Everyone could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. So that word kata, which is similar to hamartia, is that last word in that verse, and not sin, or not miss. So the target, if they were aiming at a hair, they would nail it every time. They would not miss, they would not sin. They would hit the mark every time. Sometimes we think of sin as a target and we get it flipped. We put sin on the target and then everything outside the target is lawful. When in actuality, what is lawful is the target. And everything outside of that is sin. Looking, for example, at Matthew 22. Matthew 22 the greatest commandments. Matthew 22, um, I'll start in verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees that gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So if we think of a target, we can put those two commandments on the target. Everything that misses that mark, everything that could be described as not loving God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, or loving your neighbor as yourself, is sin. That is sin. Uh, sometimes we think of sin as being neatly defined in, in certain categories, outlined often in, in big lists in different sections of the Bible. Sin is really everything that is not God's will, not God's standard. And sometimes we can think of this, and that kind of upsets us. We begin to see, wow, uh, you know, wow, I, I think I failed in, in certain ways, and we begin to make excuses, and we see that starting to go into some of these next phrases. 
So moving on from that idea of dead in trespasses and dead in sins in Ephesians 2, we see uh, several more phrases. We see in verse 2 what could be described as external forces influencing us to sin. And verse 3 is internal. But looking at the external in verse, uh, verse 2, following the world or the prince of the power of the air. A lot of times when we've sinned, we think that we're trying to follow our own way, plot our own course. Um, it's described as independence or just me doing my own thing. When actuality, it's just following everyone else. Um, if we look at Matthew 7, a passage many of us are familiar with, Matthew 7, 13 and 14, it says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Sometimes people are deceived that there's multiple right paths to God, and that's absolutely not true. It's also not true that there's multiple wrong paths. There's really only one wrong path. We may think we're plotting our own course, doing our own thing, when really we're just following uh, everyone else. And also, at the same time, we're following the prince of the power of the, uh, prince of the, power of the air. I think this is a really interesting phrase. I believe it's describing Satan or the devil here. I don't know of any other place that a similar sort of uh, phrase is used to describe the devil. Prince of the power of the air. We see he's a prince. He has power. He's not the king. He doesn't have the most power, but he does have power. If we were to read Ephesians 6, we would see the, the powers at work against us. And that's why we need the armor of God. He does have power. And he's set up as a prince, not, necessar- not necessarily because God has set him up as a prince, but in people's minds, we have set him up as a prince. We have given him power and dominion over our lives. And we think of the power of the air. Air is everywhere. His power is everywhere in this world. We think of Uh, That power is in our classrooms. That air, that power is in our classrooms. It's in the the White House. That air is even here. That air is in our homes, in our bedrooms. It's everywhere. Uh, The prince of the power of the air is everywhere. He is working hard everywhere. And when we follow sin, when we trespass, when we step over the line or miss the mark, we're really just following Uh, We're really just following Satan. And then next, we see internal influences, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind. We think about carrying out the desires of the body. And we think about examples um, in Scripture of those that gave up the love of God for physical desires. You think of Esau. Wow, Esau. Um, I, I wonder how many times he thought about that moment and took it back. When he gave up the promises given to his family, given to Abraham, we think, you know, learn this in Bible class. You got the, you got the land promise, uh, the nation promise, going to be a great nation, and there's going to be a great seed that comes through you. He gave up all of that. And for what? A bowl of soup. Wow. I hope that was a really good bowl of soup. Uh, really good bowl of soup because he gave that, all those promises up for a few moments. Probably scarfed it down too. Just a few moments of sin. And we think of other examples. We could uh, spend time thinking of David. And we think, wow, was, was, he, was he even thinking? Was he even thinking about two hours ahead, or the next day, or a week down the road, what his consequences were going to bring. We think, well, he probably wasn't thinking, actually. 
When he was going through that, he probably didn't think at all. And that's what really sin comes down to. It, it's, it's not thinking. It's more of acting like an animal than as a person made in the image of God. <laughs> carrying out the desires of the body, but also we see carrying out the desires of the mind. And that's something uh, that's, you know, sometimes harder to see. You know, we, we can imagine a, uh, you know, a drunk walking down the street and, and even worldly people would say, oh, that's, that's terrible, that's, that's shameful, what a waste of potential or whatever. Um, but at the same time, there's things that are happening up in the mind. There's religious pride. Wow, that's a, that's a big one. Uh, the Pharisees looked, just like in the example of the tax collector and the Pharisee, he, he looked at the, uh, the tax collector and saw... Um, desires of the body being carried out in him, but at the same time there was desires of the mind, there was pride working in him, that he didn't feel like we're as bad as those sort of sins. We understand the evil in this, and yet there's something that works in us. There's some sin that works in us, and it just leads to more sin and more sin. And we see this not as just a one-time occurrence, but a continual lifestyle, walking in our sins. So much so that we're described as, in the next verse, by nature, children of wrath. Not that we were particularly born that way, but by constant practice. It could be described that we were by nature, children of wrath. And you may have got to this point in the lesson, you're thinking, wow, those are some really strong words, Trey, to describe how we were in sin. Um, maybe this describes other people, but not necessarily me. And I think of uh, my life growing up. You know, as, as probably describes many of you, I was a good kid. I was a good kid, you know. Uh, my teachers described me as a good kid. My uh, coaches and uh, classmates described me as a good kid. I was a good kid in, in their minds. And especially if you were raised in the church, so to speak, if you had parents that were Christians, that's an easy thing to believe. And it's an easy thing to believe that perhaps others who... Um, lived a rough lifestyle, so to speak. Those people were dead in their sins, but not me. I was, I was a good kid. But let's look at Genesis 3. We'll see one of the, the biggest small sins in Scripture, so to speak. Genesis 3. Here we see man, Adam and Eve, in perfect harmony with God. They had everything that they... Uh, needed really everything that they wanted to, just like, just like we were, very, very innocent. Uh, we had communion with God. They literally walked with God in the garden. And the only thing they had to not do is eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Just one, just one thing, Adam and Eve, just one thing. Um, and eat a piece of fruit, too. I mean, I, I always grew up thinking fruit was good. Fruit's a good thing. There's always fruit in the fridge. Oh, fruit was always a good thing. Always allowed. Um, such a small thing, right? Why, why was it such a big deal that Eve and Adam eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? After all, it was just one mistake, and, and God even made the tree, right? He made the tree. It was in the center of the garden. But let's read Genesis 3, 1 through 6. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the, tree, the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the, tree, the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. But when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of, uh, of its fruit and ate, 
She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves one cloth. And we see them also, very shortly after, hiding themselves from God. So first we see the devil's temptation. He questioned the line. We think of trespass. He questioned the line. He said, is the line really there? Maybe it's over here. Then he questioned the consequences of that, that trespass. Are, are you really going to die? Are you really going to be dead in that sin? This provide Eve and Adam the, the perfect excuse that they need, needed to carry out their desires that they wanted. Then we also see Eve's thought process. Just like we are reading, uh, she saw she was carrying out the passions of her flesh. She saw that it was, uh, it was good to the eyes, that it was uh, delightful to eat, it was good for food. And we also see that the passions in her mind, she thought, okay, this is going to make me wise. Wow, this, this fruit is, is really great. And then she stepped over that line. She trespassed. She, she looked at, at God's word, and she said, my, my line's better. My line's better. And when she did that, she thought she was going her way, but she was really just following the devil. She was really just following the devil. And what were the consequences? Death. The consequences were death. Immediate death, because as soon as she ate, she was separated from God, the source of life itself. And this death for Adam, uh, although sometimes we, we feel that it's a little different than us, is, is very similar to us. If we look at Romans 5, Romans 5 and verse 12, I'll read through verse 14. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin was not counted where there was no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So although our sin was not like the transgression of Adam. We all sinned. We all went through that same thought process at one point in our lives or another. We saw the line. We decided to cross the line, carrying out the passions of our body and mind, following the devil. But it's a really good thing that the story doesn't end there. Oh, it's a really good thing. Because um, going into verse 4, we see this incredible phrase, but God. But God, verse 4. Uh, we see those words in the Bible, and it totally changes the story. Totally changes the picture. This is where God is going to do something that changes everything around. Uh, we see this also in Romans 5, 8. But God, shows, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Um, so I try to box, or you know, if you have a Bible, just highlight that phrase whenever you see it. But God. And we see several contrasts, these beautiful contrasts in, in this section of verses that we'll go through before grace and after grace. First, we were dead to God, verse 1, and then we were made alive again. And not just alive, but his workmanship. The, uh, in verse 10, it describes us as his workmanship. Um, this word is described to, to say that we were the product of God, and like he was the artisan, and we, and we were the uh, the, the product of his work. He shaped us like with his hands only, only him. And now we have worth. Previously we were dead. There's no, there's no worth in anything that's dead. But God saw us worthy. He gave us worth, worth and value and purpose. And then also we see another contrast in Verse 2, it describes Satan working at us, the spirit at work in the sons of disobedience. But then verse 10, he describes us as him working in us. Um, we see Satan once worked in us through our passions. 
Now God works through us, and not our passions, but through our faith in Him. Next, also we see that we're described as children of wrath. Children of wrath. But He brought us into the family. Not just transferred us into His kingdom and gave us a, uh, a cot in the, in the cellar of His kingdom so to speak. Although that would be a great place to be in the kingdom. You know, I'd be okay with uh, not a mansion in heaven, but just a, a place in the cellar. That'd be, that'd be great. Uh, but he did something so much better. He made us an heir in heaven. And we see that it's described as this, seated us with him, verse 6, in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're given a seat, and it's, it's talked about in even present tense terms. We're given a seat already in the heavenly places in Him. Colossians 3.3 3 says, Our lives are already hidden in Christ in heaven. We also see that in verse 1, we walked in sin. This is our practice. This was our walk. And now, after grace, we walk in good works. And do these works at all um, merit our salvation? You know, absolutely not. Um, I think if we have any understanding, the first three verses, there's no way that we can come close to paying back or even have the concept in our mind that we are paying back by good works, what God has done. But He's given us good works to walk in. And I think this is an interesting phrase, uh, good, good works. You know, often we think about this and we think, okay, uh, we're talking about things like feeding the poor, you know, writing cards and that sort of thing. Uh, but it goes so much beyond that, so much beyond those individual um, actions that we do. It's more than a few or even series of good actions I think really this is what he gets into when he's going through chapters 4, 5, and 6. Walk in a manner worthy of your calling. This, if you look at verse, uh, chapter 4, this totally changes the way we view other people, especially within the body of Christ. We see it totally changes our actions with regards to the outside world. And do we act like the outside world? At the end of chapter 4, chapter 5 talks about some of how we, how we speak to each other, how we speak to those outside the body, how we communicate in song. It changes our relationships in our marriage, chapter 5. It changes our relationships with our, our kids and our parents, chapter 6. changes our relationship with, uh, with our employers in, in chapter 6. And also, it changes our relationship with the devil. Now, instead of following him, we fight against him. So what does this mean to us? What, is, what does this grace mean to us? And, I, you know, I, I think first, I mean, it, this, changes, this, is, this changes everything. I think we have to take a step back and just appreciate what God has done. Um, just appreciate everything that he's done. We were dead, and there's... We didn't have anything going for us at that point besides God. Um, and also, we have no reason to boast. There's no, there's no pride in, in dead men. There's no pride at all. Um, and we think about why did God do this? Why did he have this um, plan of grace? And we see, verse 4, because... The, the explanation we're given, because of the great love in which he loved us. And then in verse 7, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. He wanted to show us how much he loved us. That was his motivation. And he has even more grace to show than what he's already done. Um, the equivalent is like somebody sacrificing their life for somebody else and also telling them, hey, here's, here's a deed to my house. I'm just going to go and give you my house, too, because I just saved your life. 
Um, you know, I, we, we don't even have an equivalent for that sort of example in human terms because it's just, it's crazy. Uh, that's, it's, it's, that grace in man's terms is absurd. It's ridiculous. Um, that God, even after doing everything that he's done, has, still has immeasurable riches of grace prepared for us. I think also um, this gives us a changed view of the saved and those who are not saved. When we look at other Christians, we don't see mere humans. We, we're looking at heirs in heaven, people seated in the heavenly places, people that are God's workmanship. That's how God views these people. And sometimes we need to see people more clearly through that lens, God's lens, that these people are saved by the same gospel, united in grace. And Paul goes on in Ephesians 2 to describe what that means to that church. Jews and Gentiles, they're, they're Jews and Gentiles no more. They're, a, they're one body together. And then to those who are not Christians, we, we, we can't look down on them because they're, they're the same as us besides the grace of God. They're dead people walking around. We should see them as dead people, not looking down on them, but they're lifeless, in need of life. Um, sometimes we talk of people that are religious even as good people. They're good people. They just need to be converted uh, to the truth. They're good people. They just need to take that last step. And really, God doesn't view people like that. They're either dead or alive. The only conversion that's talked about is from death to life. And that's how we need to view those people as well when we interact with them in the workplace, when we see those people in our families, uh, we see dead or alive. And then finally, we see in this, this passage our purpose. You know, we see the good works part at the end and like, oh boy, this is, this is where he's going to tell us we need to work. <laughs> uh, but that is our purpose. That's not just something we do. It's just, it's said that we are created, verse 10, in Christ Jesus for good works. This is our purpose, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. A lot of people spend their lives trying to find their calling. You know, young people and old people, everyone's trying to find their calling. Some people believe that they've found it and then will just renounce it a few years later. God gives us our calling. It's not something that we have to spend our lives trying to find. Our lives are simply to do good works. Uh, chapter 4 begins, walk in a manner worthy of the calling. That calling is, is good works. And because it is our calling, we shouldn't, we shouldn't take it lightly, of course. It is something that is supposed to be reflected in, like our time, our most valuable resource, our time, our money, and the way we talk, and the way we act, and particularly um, our relationships, how we interact with others, reflecting our calling. So I appreciate your time tonight and your, your kind of attention, uh, your kind attention. The uh, passage that, or the, the song that we'll be singing rather, is 420. O thou fount of every blessing. Um, I, I was about to text Nathan to lead this one right after the lesson, and uh, he had already planned on it, which is perfect. O thou fount of every blessing, and I wanted to highlight one phrase. <coughs> That's in verse 3. O oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Um, are you indebted to this grace? Are you one of those that has been made alive to God? And just like we were talking about Esau, there's really no decision here. There, there's a big decision, but there's no decision. 
immeasurable riches of his grace are waiting. Um, and I ask that you please consider that. You don't have to necessarily make, you don't have to necessarily come to the front. If you have questions, please let us know sometime tonight. We'd love to talk to you about that. Um, we'd also love to talk to anyone who feels like they haven't been working out there, uh, walking according to that calling, walking according to that calling of good works. We'd like to help you with that. And we, we'd like to help you in, in whatever way we can. If you have any need that we can help you with, please come forward as we stand and sing.